and then welcome you. And then we'll start. I'm going to introduce Mark again. Um, and then he's going to take over with this very exciting um, session today. And um, <laughs> we're all a bit sad that it's coming to an end, you know. We, we really got into these sessions. So um, let's go mute everybody. When it's your turn to speak, um, and that includes Mark, you need to unmute yourself so that you'll be ready to, to speak. So uh, welcome everybody to um, call Legends and Legacies, session three of three. And this time we're going to be looking at the arts and entertainment at the sculptors, artists, dancers, actors, um, and we're in for a, a real treat as usual. Um, Mark, the creator and producer of Legends and Legacies, was born in Durban of French Mauritius and South African parents. He studied art and design at the Durban Technicon and filmmaking at the Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles. He started his film career in the studio of Kurtz and Friends, one of Hollywood's leading independent animation studios in the 70s, progressed to being an art director, assistant director on numerous films, TV series, and commercials. Creating Legends was his first venture into producing which has been a baptism of fire for him. But amazingly, he came out with this unbelievable series. And his great find was Alan Swerdlow, who together with, with Mark did the research and Alan pops up in all these amazing places, just as he's talking about something, somehow he's there. <laughs> so um, it's amazing how they travel to all these little places. Alan is from Joburg. He completed his graduate studies at UCT's Little Theater and acted, written and directed for most of the theatrical managements in South Africa. He's one of the most highly acclaimed theater directors and a theater historian. And he was a member of the Market Theater, putting it on the road to world recognition. From there, moved to the Performing Arts Council of the Transvaal, SABC, and to Peter Turian's company as one of his principal directors. So Mark, very happy to have you give us the, the third session on legends and legacies, Mark. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and to Gail. Um, yes, now sadly we've got to the to the final episode. Well, not the final episode; it's the final of three. It's an eight um, eight episode series, and I think this episode is the most interesting and um, most entertaining. Um, and fortunately, unfortunately, um, Alan can't join us, and this was really his forte and his field that excited him most. Uh, he, he has a serious back injury and he just can't sit at all. Um, so it's really, um, I hope you will get to, to watch a recording. So as uh, Geraldine said, this is really about the artists, the entertainers, the painters, the sculptors, um, who really kind of um, blessed South Africa with their talents um, over a number of years. So let me start with um, the introduction and um, we can take it from there. If there are any problems, please shout. Hyman Lieberman served as the mayor of Cape Town three times. He was one of the initiators of this institution, the Ezeko South African National Gallery, whose core collection came from a donation by Alfred de Pass, grandson of the same Aaron de Pass, who brought the first Torah scroll to South Africa. These doors are a memorial tribute to Polish-born Hyman Lieberman, who in his official capacity as mayor, opened the Cape Town Hebrew Congregation Synagogue in the Company Gardens. They were sculpted by Herbert Vladimir Meyerowitz, one of the educated Jews allowed to live outside of the Pale of Settlement, 
and who emigrated to South Africa to teach at the University of Cape Town's Michaelis Art School. The theme of the Doors imagery, the wanderings of the Jewish people, but in this case, Meyerowitz literally carved their arrival in South Africa, quoting imagery from the Cape Colony. He even included the image of the Smos, the itinerant country peddler trader so central to our community history. History, iconography and identity, marking an entrance to the National Art Gallery, all fuse in a symbol of South African Jewish artistic expression. And I think it's such a great introduction because we now know exactly it's it's been set up and we will see exactly how uh, South African Jews have made such incredible contributions. We can assume that artistic expression was not very high on the list of intentions of those early Jewish immigrants into the Cape Colony. Survival and the pursuit of Panassa, a livelihood, was their primary occupation. In seeking to establish themselves in their new home, there wasn't much time for cultural pursuits to begin with. Later, once there were synagogues and Torah scrolls, one of the oldest forms of Jewish folk art reappeared. The sewing and embroidery of binding girdles for the scrolls, the curtains that screened the ark and decorated covers for the Torahs. And in this traditional way, it is the women of the community who get the first chance at something higher than day-to-day -day existence. There hasn't really been a solid tradition of Judaica in the South African Jewish community, those ritual objects treated as folk art. The candlesticks, the Torah scroll finials called rimonim, spice towers, wine cups for kiddush, menorahs and the like came with the immigrants from their place of origin and later were imported. Only very recently have we seen the creation of beaded mezuzot or yarmulkes made of shweshwe cloth that speak to the South African experience. It seems as if South African Jewish artists leapfrogged the pool of folk art and went straight to their chosen form of expression. Now, this is Alan uh, walking into the Urbester Museum in Cape Town, uh, which is now um, it, it looked after by, by UCT. The South African Jewish contribution to the development of the arts in South Africa is worthy of a documentary series of its own. Selecting just a few individuals to tell the story of the many is exceptionally difficult, but it had to be done. Just know that there are many, many individuals that have contributed to the whole. Unlike most of the significant South African Jewish visual artists, Irma Stern was actually born here in a small rural town called Schweizerenica in northwest Transvaal, where her father, a German immigrant, had a successful trading store and cattle farm. Because of his support for the Boer Republic, he was interned during the Anglo-Boer War, and Irma and her mother and brother, like many Transvaal Jews, relocated to Cape Town. After the war, with the family reunited, they went to Germany, where the family was trapped for the duration of the First World War, and it was there that Irma began her art studies, first at the Weimar Academy and afterwards in Berlin, where she had her first exhibition in 1919. Her constant traveling became a hallmark feature of her life. And it was her travels in Central Africa that inspired much of her work, though she adapted the expressionist style she had learned in Germany to her individual signature. 
Initially derided in South Africa, she was recognized and praised in Europe. Receiving the Prix d'honneur at the Bordeaux International Exhibition in 1927 helped to shield her from a lot of vituperative criticism in her home country. One of her fiercest critics was fellow artist Edward Roweth, who was a firm supporter of Hitler's degenerate art exhibition in Munich, which ridiculed expressionism and modern art. The expressionist way of thinking was very angry, it was very potent, it, it engaged very specifically with the, with the immorality of the time in Germany. And perhaps South African artists picked that up, breaking with tradition, breaking with the decent little um, landscapes and, 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 and brookie lace and, and that, those kinds of images, the sedate little still lives that had been made. And if I think of Irma Stearns, even her still lives were never sedate. They were wild and passionate and full of, full of energy and, 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 and anger in, in many respects. And I don't think she consciously was traveling around Africa um, buying things like door frames and what have you, painting the people there out of her Jewish ethos. Um, I think it was just simply out of her passion and her curiosity to see more, to experience more. But looking at the broader circle of arts support, Initially, and I speak specifically of, of Irma Stern, she was vilified by the press as being incompetent, as being pornographic even. Um, and the community vociferously supported that. So they hated her initially. And I would say much of that would, would have applied on a level to the, men, to the men artists. But I think a lot of that criticism came because she was a woman. But further to that, as the years progressed and art critics began to see the value of Stern, so did the community begin to love her and adore her and claim her as one of their own. When Stern exhibited in Johannesburg in 1933, the headline of the Sunday Times Review was Irma Stern's Chamber of Horrors. Ironically, Stern's work today commands the highest prices on auction for any South African artist. Her subject matter was not intrinsically Jewish, instead showing the imagery and culture of the regions of the African continent to which she had travelled. Yet, as her national and international reputation grew, owning an Irma Stern still life or portrait became a point of pride or aspiration for many world to do Jewish families. One of Stern's friends was Lippi Lipschitz. Born Israel Isaac Lipschitz to a devout family in Plunian, Lithuania, his father emigrated to South Africa, leaving his wife and child in the care of his own father until he could send for them. Lipschitz finally came to South Africa in 1908. He was 19 when he began serious art studies at the Cape Town Art School, where he met Moses Kotler, who introduced him to the new trends and the modernist movement. A few years later, he made the acquaintance of Herbert Vladimir Meyerowitz, the man who carved the memorial doors for Mayor Leibovitz, and Meyerowitz invited Lipschitz to become his assistant at the Michaelis School of Art. Lipschitz claimed to have learned a great deal from Meyerowitz, particularly about West African sculpture, but a personal disagreement led to Lipschitz going his own way. Thanks to a grant from Ernest Oppenheimer, he was able to study in Paris. There he associated with and befriended the Jewish modernists like Soutine and Modigliani, and he also adopted the nickname of Lippi. On his return to Cape Town, he set up a studio with Wolf Kibble and began exhibiting paintings and sculptures. Like Irma Stern, he found an initial implacable resistance to the modern movement but in classic style, the younger generation confronted the older traditionalists and eventually triumphed. Jewish themes and traditional motifs were important to Lipschitz, ideas instilled in him by his Hasidic grandfather, and the National Gallery in Cape Town acquired fine examples in The Tree of Life and Jacob Wrestling with the Angel. Lippi went on to an increasingly distinguished career. He taught at Michaelis, eventually becoming associate professor, and produced a considerable body of prized work. 
Regarded as one of the four greatest sculptors of South Africa, he made Aliyah at the age of 75, settling in Kiryat Tivon in Israel, where he died two years later. Wolf Kibble was born in a small shtetl in Poland, where his father was the cantor and the shochet for the community, but also carved miniatures, composed cantorial music, and was the local bookbinder. His death resulted in the family moving to Warsaw, and the threat of conscription led to Kibble fleeing to Vienna. After considerable hardship, he made his way to Palestine, where he associated with the local bohemian art community. Kibble's brother was already living in Cape Town, and an affidavit from him allowed Kibble to arrive in South Africa in 1929. Like the two other artists I've mentioned, Kibble's first serious exhibition in South Africa was met by the same open hostility. The South African art establishment really did not appreciate or respond to the avant-garde. Whilst working on what became his final exhibition, Kibble was diagnosed with advanced tuberculosis and died, tragically young, aged 34. Perhaps now is the time to mention briefly the whole notion of patronage in South Africa. The Jewish landlords, adopting the Victorian and Edwardian practices around them, were accepting of notions of patronage, but mainly on a community level. Rather than the support of one or two selected artists, it was the good works of adding to cultural infrastructures that drew their attention. I've already mentioned how the South African National Gallery was partly initiated by Hyman Lieberman with support from the de Pass family. In Johannesburg, the Johannesburg Art Gallery came about as an initiative of Lionel and Florence Phillips, together with assistance from a number of landlords, including Max Michaelis, who had donated his personal art collection to the city of Cape Town, housed in the townhouse gallery on Green Market Square, and funded the Chair of Fine Arts at the University of Cape Town, hence the Michaelis Art School. In many instances, these worthies had assembled personal collections of varying quality because personal art collections were the done thing to possess as a way of displaying one's wealth and taste. Quite often they lost interest or patience and then looked around for a place for them to donate what they had, hence the leaning towards civic upliftment. As individual wealth increased within the community, so did the number of personal commissions. A portrait, a bust, something to decorate the lobby of the company headquarters. But there was, for the most part, no sustained bankrolling of cultural or artistic expression. Considering the general circumstances uh, Mark, in which the Jewish I, community was living at the turn of the last here? century and... In, yes, please do. <clears throat> I just wanted to come in and say here about the um, Johannesburg Art Gallery and the contributions that the Rand Lords made. I mentioned to Mark that it was Flory Phillips, Lionel Phillips's wife, who wrote to Max Michaelis and said, listen, my young man, if you want to have a, an honour bestowed on you, you have to do something for the community. So how about giving your art collection or finding an art collection to donate to uh, to the um, the art gallery, particularly the one that they were starting. So that was a recognized way of getting honors in Britain rather than looking after artists in South Africa. And I also mentioned to Mark that uh, Julius Werner, who was Alfred Beit's partner, that he wasn't Jewish, bought a big fancy stately home in Hertfordshire. And as with all these uh, Rand Lords, they had an art advisor who told them what to buy. And he collected a whole lot of furniture and sculpture and delicate things, but he didn't know how to display them. So one room in his big house was like an art junk room. And just everywhere in this room are vitrines and, and cupboards and things of all this stuff. <laughs> so, um, Thanks, <laughs> let's, let's go on. 
the next 20 years or so, you can be sure that if Mrs. Rabinovitz said, Michael, come, I want you should paint my ceiling, she meant in a nice shade of white enamel. Financial support for artists and creators such as it was came in the purchase of the finished product by those who could afford it. Providing financial support to allow the artist to experiment and create, not so much. And now the tale of two sculptors, though one of them worked in other mediums in addition to three-dimensionality. That, of course, was Moses Kotler, once again a product of the Lithuanian immigration, though he took a somewhat circuitous route to South Africa, much like Wolf Kibble. When his parents decided to emigrate from Lithuania, Moses was sent to be educated in Palestine, and he eventually studied at the Bezalel School of Arts in Jerusalem before furthering his studies in Munich and Paris, where he too lived the vie bohème. He first settled in Otsuan, where he began to sculpt for the first time, and then relocated to Cape Town. Ironically, it was in Cape Town that Kotler befriended D.C. Burnsire, the cartoonist who created the anti-Semitic image of Hoggenheimer, the voracious plutocrat, and Burnsire remained one of his staunchest supporters, with Kotler painting his portrait numerous times. Kotler's early sculpture exhibitions received the same strongly negative response that Stern and Kibble received, but he persisted until he was as highly regarded as Lippi Lipschitz. Herman Wald came to South Africa as a refugee from Nazi Germany, though he'd been born in Hungary, the son of an eminent rabbi. He established his own studio soon after arriving, but the advent of the Second World War saw Wald joining the South African Defence Force. This miners' monument is one of the few public commissions still on display in the country. Geraldine, would you like to talk about the um, uh, these uh, statues? Yes, sir. <laughs> this, this, of course, is in Kimberley, um, where um, they so this is in the middle of the Sir Ernest Oppenheimer Gardens. Um, and just funnily enough, I've been looking into this and I just wrote for the Kimberley people a newsletter, which I forwarded to some of you, about this statue by Herman Walt. And what happened in this, this was opened in 1962 or something, and what has happened since then is the server's disappeared. Um, the next thing is that the fountains are all filled with um, uh, plastic bottles and rubbish. And the next thing is that the arms of these miners have been chopped off and some of them have been taken down. So it's a little bit of a indication of what's happening and the whole reason why there was this huge empty place in the middle of Kimberley was that De Beers had given this land to the local uh, municipality and said you've got to clear the land and what was there this was the called the Malay camp this is where from the time of the earliest diamond diggings different nationalities from the East Indies, from Malaya, from Indonesia, from India, the colored people, some blacks, some whites, all live together in a thriving community called the Malay camp. And from the 1940s and 50s, this was cleared even before the Group Areas Act. This was an act of De Beers and what they put in place was Sir Ernest Oppenheimer Gardens with his memorial fountain. And just one other little uh, thing is it depicts uh, the black miners, but there's one of them for each of the five big mines in Kimberley. So some commission in 2015 decided that Rhodes' statue in Kimberley could remain because that was part of the history, although it might need to be relocated, whatever that means. 
but that this statue shouldn't remain because it depicts, you know, the white miners. Really? <laughs> anyway, so this is the vexed question of, of this, but let's get back to the sculptor, um, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Paul was a significant influence on his personal perspective and anti-war themes or expressions of anguish at man's inhumanity were a significant part of his creativity alongside Judaic or biblical subject matter. Three works particularly are much loved by the South African Jewish community. Kriya, the rending of one's garments as an act of mourning, is the twice life-sized statue that stood in the grounds of Sandringham Gardens, the home for the Jewish aged in Johannesburg. The world poured much of his feelings about the Holocaust into that statue. He received the commission for the Holocaust Memorial, which stands at West Park Jewish Cemetery and is the site of the annual Holocaust Remembrance Service held in Johannesburg each year. The wings of the Shekhinah were two enormous angel wings that sheltered the Aron Kodesh of the Berea Synagogue. A fourth work is one of the most favored. I'll just say quickly that both that statue, the Kriya statue and the wings statue, uh, both of them have disappeared. We believe that the family may have them in storage, uh, but we haven't been able to confirm that. Public sculptures by all Johannesburg citizens. Um, can I it stood say, in the center um, of downtown Johannesburg. And yeah, sure, Geraldine. Um, I also wanted to say something uh, about Herman Walt, that his brother was the rabbi in Kimberley at, at the time, in the late 1930s, and it was his brother, who was a very erudite rabbi, uh, brought out his brother, the sculptor, from Hungary, or from oh, wherever yeah. he was at the time, yeah, from Europe. Oh, interesting. Until recently, but after it was repeatedly vandalized, hooves and legs were sawn off for scrap metal sails, it was restored and relocated to the pedestrian walkway outside Anglo-American headquarters. I teach at different universities. There are no longer the kind of quantity of, of young fine arts students who are Jewish that they used to be 10, 15 years ago. Kids are no longer opting to study the humanities or the arts as they were. And having said that, I'm just trying to think of South African artists who are engaging with what it means, or South African Jewish artists, who are engaging what it, with what it means to be Jewish and South African in the, in the, in, in the 2020s. And off the top of my head, I actually can't think of anyone. I think these youngsters are going into business. They're not even studying the arts. They, they're abandoning their talents for the idea of making money. And that's purely my own opinion. But I'm not seeing young Jewish people coming out into the world and making work that is of value to a broader understanding of what it means to be South African and Jewish. When it comes to the performing arts, the stage, as it were, becomes even more crowded. In the same way that the Jewish community was in at the inception of the city of Johannesburg, Jewish involvement in the professional performing arts was there from the very start. The first professional company to set up in early Johannesburg was led by one Luscom Cyril, who arrived in the mining encampment in 1888 a mere two years after the discovery of gold on the Witwatersrand. He arrived with his own theatre, transported in wood and iron sections from Ladysmith in the Natal colony. Called the Theatre Royal, it replaced an earlier structure of the same name which had been much more of a saloon and music hall, and Cyril had his erected on the corner of Commissioner and Elof streets. Cyril joined forces with Louis Cohen, who had been a performer and writer in Kimberley and had often shared the stage there with Barney Bonato in sketches, short plays and comedy routines. 
Bernardo never lost his taste for the stage and even carried on performing when he was a well-established mining magnate. Cyril had his ups and downs during the course of his career and eventually returned to England, but during his time here, consistently engaged with the Jewish community and even sponsored a number of benefit performances in aid of the building fund for the Witwatersrand Hebrew congregation for the construction of its first synagogue. One of his signature flourishes was to wear yarmulke when conducting his orchestra. But the reason has been lost to time. Henry Judah Stodel arrived in South Africa the year after Luscombe Cyril set up shop in Johannesburg. Born in London, he gained his first taste for the boards in music halls there, where he was billed as Harry Stodel. And though his arrival and early appearances in Johannesburg were modestly scaled, he soon became one of the most dominant ebullient figures of South African entertainment. His actual trade was cigar selling, but he had also acquired some expertise in the gentlemanly art of pugilism. Like Barney Bernardo, he was a fine boxer. Those skills didn't save him, though, when he was attacked near Alberton and robbed of his cart and load of cigars by Boer commandos, who called him a bloody yurt and sent him on his way. By this stage, he had bought Cyril's Royal Theatre of Varieties in Johannesburg, but the Boer encounter rattled him to the point that he decided to relocate to Cape Town with his family, where he did so well, he was able to purchase the Tivoli Theatre, which stood just behind the new city hall overlooking the parade. Harry was an early investor in the newfangled motion picture business, buying films and equipment and setting up screenings not only at the Tivoli, where they formed part of the variety program, but also leasing them to bioscopes in country towns. He later added these local halls to his expanding property portfolio, which had also been augmented by the addition of the Alhambra Theatre in Cape Town. And then Harry met Izzy. Isidore W. Schlesinger was born in Slovakia, but grew up in New York City. He arrived in South Africa to flog chewing gum for an American company and soon went his own way, making a great deal of money in real estate and insurance. But his heart was set on the movie business. By the time he met Harry Stodel, variety shows and musical entertainments were losing their luster and silent pictures were capturing the attention of the public. Schlesinger made Stodel an offer and the African Theatre's trust was born. It created an entire touring circuit for visiting companies from abroad and up the ante with some of the most illustrious performers of the day. It included stars like George Roby and Marie Lloyd. African theatres begat African consolidated theatres that became the dominant entertainment company in South Africa. The company morphed into various iterations, culminating in the Ster Kineko Empire. Jim Stodel, Harry's second son, was groomed by Schlesinger to succeed him, and the roster of genuine international stars that he brought to this country is the stuff of legend. Many people don't realize that South Africa has one of the oldest film industries in the world, paralleling the rise of Hollywood. And its initial impetus came from the Anglo-Boer War with the effort to capture the news of the conflict with the aid of the newfangled kinematograph. It was Izzy Schlesinger who shaped it into a professional industry by building the first genuine film studios in the country on a section of Cook's farm he had bought for the purpose. Kilani Film Studio's first output was African Mirror, one of the first and longest running of the newsreels that were screened each week in the cinemas. One of the very first South African feature films, silent of course, was The Voortrekkers, shot almost entirely at Kilani, which, once the technology was available, converted to sound productions. 
Schlesinger also instituted a magazine called Stage and Cinema to promote the various offerings of African and later African consolidated theatres. And South Africans of a certain age can still remember the cries of Stage and Cinema from the Usherettes. The Kilani Film Studios and the acreage around it were eventually sold off to give way to the high-end Kilani Mall. And the film enterprise moved location to what is now Sasani in Belfort Park, another once predominantly Jewish suburb. Uh, just to interject here, um, the entire archive of Schlesinger's uh, films and documentaries um, it was just, we couldn't find it anywhere. We tried and tried and tried. There may be stuck, tucked away in some archives in Pretoria at the National Museum, uh, but we just couldn't find them. It was really quite uh, quite sad because that's the more groundbreaking work of our film industry. Schlesinger was one of the most remarkable Jewish entrepreneurs the country has seen. Property, banking, insurance, advertising, and commercial farming were all part of his portfolio. When he died, he was buried on his Zebedelia estate, then the biggest citrus orchards in the world. Uh, just another interjection. Um, Zebedelia became a land claim and was handed over to a tribal trust. And unfortunately, all the trees were, were chopped down for firewood. And there have been various attempts to resurrect it, but I don't think anything's ever happened. But in tandem with this entertainment for the general public, the Jewish community provided diversions expressly for the Jewish community. Yiddish theatre, performed in the vernacular of East European Jewry rather than the sacred language of the Bible, has a long and venerable history. The Litvak immigrants to South Africa arrived with a taste for these performances acquired in their home regions. And by the mid-1880s, amateur performances were being staged in Johannesburg. The first international and professional troupe arrived here in 1897 from New York, where Yiddish theatre was flourishing. Two more troops, one from London and one from America, competed for audiences after the Anglo-Boer War, while the Winter Gardens in District 6 became a home for Yiddish theatre in Cape Town. Sarah Sylvia first appeared there as a child for Morris Waxman, one of the competing companies on the Vitvatus front. When he returned to the UK some years later, he took Sarah with him, and she was soon established in London as the leading lady for Morris Moscovich. And she only returned to Johannesburg in 1921, where she began to train and work with local amateurs in a succession of productions and began her ascent as one of the stars of the South African stage, eventually working both in Yiddish and in English. It was in her capacity as an impresario that Sylvia kept a stream of professional Yiddish troops coming to this country, drawn from North and South America, Britain and Europe. But homegrown products were few and far between and strictly on an amateur basis. Yiddish theatre sputtered on through the 50s into the 60s, and then the flame finally went out. Part of this was due to political factors and the strength of the Zionist cause in South Africa, with Hebrew being propagated in preference to what was perceived as a dated ghetto and shtetl language, particularly with the advent of the Jewish day schools across the country. The first piano in the mining camp of Johannesburg arrived with the Alexander family in 1887 when they relocated from the Cape, bringing the young Muriel with them. The family sold the piano to a saloon on what became Commissioner Street when they were requested to do so for the thirsty miners to have some musical entertainment. Muriel was sent somewhat reluctantly by her father to study at the Herbert Beerbohm Tree Academy in London, soon to become the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and on graduating made her first professional appearance on the London stage. Her first South African performances were with a touring company from London, and Muriel then began to direct for the 
the Jewish Guild in Johannesburg, as well as staging and acting in independently produced dramas. She wanted more, though, and conceived the idea of a local repertory company. The Johannesburg Repertory Players came into being in 1927 with the first public performances given the following year. The play was R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, which attracted a lot of attention and even required a second run later in the year. It was during that season that the first electric traffic lights were erected in Johannesburg and a newspaper article dubbed them robots after the play. So Muriel Alexander was in a way responsible for the South African slang reference to traffic lights, which has endured as robots ever since. The Rep's initial home was the Hall of the Jewish Guild War Memorial Building on Von Brandes Street in Johannesburg, though they sometimes used the old Standard Theatre, which originally stood on the first site of Hermanwald's Springbok Fountain. Eventually, the repertory players built their own theatre in Bramfontein at a time when fully professional, homegrown theatre was beginning to flower in this country. When it opened, a Hermanwald bust of Muriel Alexander was unveiled in the foyer. Ten years later, the reps renamed their theatre the Alexander in honour of their founder. Uh, this, uh, the Alexander Theatre, well, that's still standing and has all the signage. Um, it's now an evangelical um, church. Um, and there were some really big, strong-looking um, bounces at the door wouldn't let us in, so we couldn't establish where that bust of Muriel still exists. The list of South African jury who were and are an indispensable part of South African theatre is endless. Most of them actors. However, in addition to Muriel Alexander, six Jewish directors, or to use the old parlance, producers, were fundamental to the shaping and development of a truly professional South African theatre, and their influences felt right up to the present day. Leontine Sagan was born in Budapest but raised in Clarksdorp and endured the Anglo-Boer War in Johannesburg. She was then taken by her mother to complete her schooling in Vienna where she was an avid attendee of productions at the State Opera House and the Berg Theatre. Back home in South Africa she worked as a bookkeeper and as a minor secretary for the Austro-Hungarian consulate but journeyed to audition for the great German-Jewish director Max Reinhardt and secured a place at his school in Berlin. Sagan, a name bestowed on her by Reinhardt, her family name was also Schlesinger, began her career in Austria and Germany. Apart from securing her reputation as a great actress, she began to direct, acquiring an equally acclaimed production. It was in the Germany of the 30s and the rising tide of anti-Semitism that Sagan directed her first and most important film, the legendary Mädchen in Uniform, banned as shockingly decadent by the Nazis. She then began a peripatetic existence working in South Africa, Britain and the USA. It was during this time that she began her celebrated collaboration with Ivan Novello. In South Africa, she directed for the Little Theatre in Cape Town and for Muriel Alexander's repertory players, even though the two had a frosty relationship. Eventually, after the war, she was asked to join the fledgling National Theatre Organization in South Africa the forerunner of the Provincial Performing Arts Councils, as the artistic director for the English language section. Tough, uncompromising and demanding, Sagan is celebrated as the person who first brought the German or European approach to theatre in South Africa. Meanwhile, a homegrown product born in Lukov, a tiny dorp in the Free State, rose to become the doyen of South African producer-directors, though she began her career as an actress. As Toby Kuschlik recounted herself, 
As a child, she was fond of reciting emotional monologues. Whilst standing atop the toilet and pulling the chain for dramatic effect at the appropriate moments. Beginning as an actress, she soon found herself at odds with many of the theatrical authority figures and so became one of the rare female actor managers in the country. Many an actor, stage manager, or designer grew to recognize the repeated thump thump of her oversized rings on the table. It was both an admonishment and a negative response to whatever she was witnessing. It was also, in effect, the last word on the subject. In the latter part of her career, when she worked exclusively as a director and producer, she brought many of the great international musicals to South Africa, such as Cabaret and Fiddle on the Roof, through her own productions and staging. But the a small off-Broadway review, however, became her greatest success. Jacques Brel is alive and well and living in Paris, opened at a small converted nightclub in an hotel in Hillbrow, and went on to become the longest-running stage show in South African entertainment history. When she died in 1991, such was her reputation that when the news spread, a well-known local actor quietly remarked, she'll be back. The life of Cape Tonian Leonard Schach straddled all three phases of South African theater. He was a youthful witness to the early heyday of Harry Stodel and I.W. Schlesinger. He was strongly active in the middle transition into a fully professional industry. And the final phase had Schach as a still active grand old man and mentor of South African theater as it morphed into its post-apartheid identity. He began his directing career at Cape Town's Little Theatre, alongside the roster of non-Jewish talent that was moulded in that important crucible. Later, he founded the first professional theatre company in the mother city, called the Cockpit Players. It had nothing to do with the aircraft and everything to do with an old slang reference to Shakespeare's theatre. It eventually found its permanent home at the Hofmeyer Theatre in Cape Town, and nurtured a remarkable group of notable South African actors, many of whom went on to international careers, such as Sir Nigel Hawthorne, Estelle Kohler, Brian Murray, and Joss Ackland. Schach went on to direct in the USA, Belgium, the United Kingdom, Finland, and Italy, as well as his home country, but eventually made Aliyah to Israel and began to direct at the Habima and Kamari theaters. He began to return to South Africa on request to direct productions for all the major managements, including the New Market Theater in Johannesburg, as well as one of the productions for the opening of the State Theater in Pretoria. Someone whose history and achievements paralleled Schachs in many ways was Leon Gluckman. Born in Johannesburg, the son of Henry Gluckman, who had served as Minister of Health and Housing, in one of Jan Smuts's cabinets. He... Um, Gail, I know you wanted to mention something about the, about this family. He began his career as an actor. After theatre studies abroad, Leon returned to work for the new National Theatre Organization in South Africa in its inaugural season and was directed by Leontin Sagan. He left South Africa once more to become a member of the Old Vic Company in London, but returned home two years later, even as his international reputation was beginning to soar. Surprisingly, once he was resettled here, one of his first activities was to record a series of readings from the Bible for the South African Zionist Federation, released as a long playing record to raise funds for the Fed. While Gluckman would go on to direct an enviable string of national and international successes, including Waiter Minim, one of his signal achievements was helming the iconic South African musical King Kong. One of the key factors in the development of multiracial theater in defiance of the apartheid nationalist government and the launching pad 
of an astonishing array of talent, including legends such as Miriam Makeba and Hugh Masakela. Ian Bernhard, a successful actor and director in his own right, had founded a music organization devoted to the development of black musicians. Prior to that, he'd staged an all-black production of The Comedy of Errors and was committed to the cause of multiracial theater in this country. The organization was called the Union of African Artists, later United Artists, and was based here at Dorke House, the only center for the creative arts for the black population of Johannesburg. He approached Gluckman to direct a stage show based on the life of a much-storied Sophia Town boxer, Ezekiel Glamini. Virtually the entire creative team attached to the project was Jewish, even down to the backstage crew and publicists, and the premier performance here at the Witz University Great Hall marked a major turning point for the development of the performing arts here. Apart from the two-year tour of South Africa, King Kong spent years touring abroad. Incidentally, the designer of the entire production was architect and painter Arthur Goldreich, who would subsequently be one of those arrested in the Ravonia raid on Lily's Leaf Farm. Another regular at Dorke House and its performance venue, the Bantu Men's Social Club, was Barney Simon. Born to Litvak immigrants to Johannesburg, Barney grew up in the Jewish milieu of Dornfontein and Troivel in Johannesburg. After working abroad, he met Athel Fugard and assisted him with the production at Dorke House, the home of Ian Bernard's Union of African Artists. Barney had found his métier, and it was there that he learned his craft as a director and writer. Sadly, the building now is somewhat run down and has been converted to a block of flats. The only marker, the City Heritage Plaque, which recounts the history of this remarkable organization. A period in America working with avant-garde theater makers and theorists was particularly productive, but Barney was forced to return home after the death of his father, and he formed the Phoenix Players, working in loaned rooms at Witz University. The work performed by the company was an early forerunner of what became to be known as protest theater. It was later, after he met and began his collaboration with Manny Manham through the formation of the company, that his theories and approach to meaningful indigenous theater that had something to say about the South African situation were further developed and refined. Manham and Simon soon became the driving force behind the establishment of the market theater which soon garnered an international reputation, and where Barney brought his protest theater to full fruition. One of the last productions he directed, perhaps in memory of his Yiddish childhood, was a staging of Ansky's The Dibuk. He would always quote an old Hasidic legend to explain the magic of theater to aspirant actors and directors. Why did God create man? Because he is so fond of hearing stories. Born in Benoni Central, opposite the town hall and stayed struck at a young age, Percy Tucker became the man who allowed this smooth and effective interface of the world of theatre with the general public. I was born in 1928 and uh, when I was about um, 14, the town hall where we lived in Princess Avenue, right opposite the town hall, they developed a, 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 a amateur dramatic society called the East Rand Theatre Club. And uh, we used to have uh, shows at the Baloney Town Hall and then I joined the East Rand Theatre Club. I swept the stages and I cleaned the dishes and I was, uh, I opened the curtains. I even did the lights for Toby Kushlik and the lights went on at the wrong time and it wasn't my fault. And she came backstage and she's told me in no uncertain terms and words that I've never heard that the only thing I'm good at is selling the tickets. 
<laughs> in the late 1940s, after the war, the big show started coming. You know, uh, Oklahoma, Brigadoon, Any Get Your Gun, Perchance a Dream. And it was difficult to get tickets because in Bernoni, you don't, there was no way to get tickets. So I used to have to get up and take the first train to Johannesburg. And in 1951, they announced that the Italian opera company with uh, Gili and his daughter and Tito Gobbi were coming. Uh, and I went onto the queue at Friday afternoon. We sat outside His Majesty's and slept outside His Majesty's for um, three, three nights and got to the front of the stage when they opened at nine o'clock on Monday. And I said, I'd like... 27 and 6 million tickets because I was buying for the Benoni uh, Music Society. And the chap, he said, I'm sorry, all the tickets and the cheaper seats have been kept for Mr. Stodel's friends. And I'm not a dramatic person, but I, I got on the stage and to my absolute surprise, I got up and screamed at everybody. I said, this is the biggest shyster business you've ever known. Mr. Stadel is dishonest and he has no integrity. And one day I will show you how a box office should be run with honesty and integrity. And in 1954, Leon Gluckman, the famous director of King Kong of Vinci in 1959, uh, said to me, Percy, I need a business manager for King Lear, directed by Elizabeth Sneddon. And I looked around we had no place for posters nobody could give you tickets and nobody could give you publicity for the theater etc there was just no system and while we were ar arranging the king lear booking i saw a little shop opening in 100 elof street we decided that we were going to open a booking office to show what a theater shop should look like and what it should, it must sell tickets, it must do everything. I knew that there had to be a better way of doing things. I mean, because without an audience, a performance is meaningless. And, and we were making it so difficult for people to get tickets, it was ridiculous. And then in 1968, I read a, a story in Variety that they were looking at computerization of the theater industry. I went right around the world and saw every system that they were trying to work on. And then it, I heard on December the 31st, 1970, that the uh, this, uh, SRS, uh, System Reservation Systems, were closing down. I took the plane that night to London, interviewed the 12 most important people and brought them out to South Africa in February. And the next thing in the star was Benoni Boy's Space Age Scheme first in the world and eventually when I retired in 1994 we had every soccer match, every uh, uh, sporting event, every theatre and now computer has, has extended itself all the way up Africa and doing soccer matches everywhere. I'm just a 91 year old retired ticket seller. That's all. We had such a great time interviewing Percy, and he had so many anecdotal stories about his life that we could have made a documentary uh, just on him alone. Um, sadly, he has now passed away, but um, he has he does have that book that um, that he's published on his life in the theatre. The world of oh, both serious and popular Let's music. Listen to this music carefully and see if you can find out. Um, how it was used later on. It had a hallmark participation of South African jury both as participants and as audiences. In fact, the non-proportional support by the community was extremely noticeable, particularly at the time of High Holy Days and Jewish festivals, when a performance, be it music, dance or drama, could lose as much as 60% of its audience. The absence of the Jewish community became more noticeable and more permanent at the time of the state of emergency exodus, when many regular attendees and subscribers relocated, be it to Israel, Australia, Canada, USA, and the UK. 
Another contemporary factor has been the rise of stricter orthodox religious affiliation amongst the dwindling community with its attendant proscriptions of mixed audiences, the increasing adherence to the kol isha, the voice of woman injunction, and a perception that subject material might be offensive to their religious principles, the more open-minded members of the community are still enthusiastic supporters, despite now being in the minority and no longer the audience majority that they once were. Music in its Western forms accompanied the first Jewish immigrants as they made their way into the African continent. The later Litvak immigrants brought their own music with them. And because the Litvak community had maintained the synagogue as central to community life, much of it was cantorial. Cantorial music, or chazonis, developed to a remarkable degree in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Europe, as the South African Jewish community melded into a more homogenized whole, much of the European tradition was imported wholesale. This included the cantors themselves, who evolved into a drawcard and focus of pride at selected synagogues. Much like the theatre performers, South African Jewish involvement in serious music was on an individual basis, with instrumentalists, conductors and composers participating as musicians, not Jews. One signal development was the Jewish Guild Orchestra, founded in 1944 by Dr. Solly Aronofsky, which was a mainstay of functions of the Jewish community. Initially, it was comprised of amateur musicians, but as it developed, it acquired a semi-professional status and often recorded and broadcast with noted professional musicians and soloists. In the field of popular music, South African Jews recur again and again, some as band leaders and some as pop stars. Trevor Rabin was born into a musical family in Johannesburg, with his mother a classical pianist and his father a lead violinist with the Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra. He first began work as a session musician, and though he studied orchestration and conducting, he elected to pursue a career as a rock star. The most famous of his bands was Rabbit, seminal to the experience of many young South Africans in the 70s. He emigrated first to London, we worked with another South African Jewish emigre, Manfred Mann, and then to Los Angeles, and went on to become an award-winning composer of film scores. Johnny Clegg was actually born in Britain, but grew up in Zimbabwe and then Johannesburg. At the age of 17, he met Sipo Ouno, with whom he formed a musical partnership, which they named Juluka performing initially in secret and at private venues because of the apartheid laws, and developing their signature Zulu guitar style of Maskandi. Clegg also studied and lectured in anthropology at Witz, something to which he was equally committed. A lot of Clegg's output has been described as a key component of the music of the anti-apartheid struggle years for which he eventually received both local and international recognition. His subsequent band, Savuka, toured internationally despite restrictions at home, and he eventually crowned his achievements with an enviable solo career. The world of dance was again populated by a roll call of South African Jews. In the field of classical ballet, John Crank achieved an international reputation as a choreographer. Born in Rustenburg, he studied with Dulcie Howes at the University of Cape Town Ballet School. He then relocated to London to study further at Sadler's Wells and joined the company. And by the 50s, Cranko had become a full-time choreographer. In 1961, he became the artistic director of the Stuttgart Ballet and led it to international acclaim. He died tragically young at the age of 45 on board a transatlantic flight 
but left many creations which have become the classics of the international ballet repertoire. Phyllis Spiro grew up in Orange Grove in Johannesburg, attending both Hebrew nursery school and ballet classes at the tender age of four. At 15, her parents allowed her to attend the Royal Ballet School in London because of her exceptional promise. She began her career with the Royal Ballet, touring internationally for years before homesickness brought her back to South Africa, where she initially joined Pact Ballet and later Kepa Ballet, where her exceptional ability resulted in a sequence of ballets choreographed especially for her. This is the crown that she wore as Aurora in Sleeping Beauty, the real thing. In 1984, she was declared South Africa's first prima ballerina assoluta, a very rare honor. After injury forced her retirement from dancing, she served as KPAB's ballet mistress. Together with her husband, she took over the Dance for All program, teaching underprivileged children in the townships of the Western Cape. The world of contemporary dance in South Africa was due initially almost entirely to a trio of indefatigable Jewish women. Rhoda Orlin, Sylvia Glasser, and Adele Blank. They were able to fuse both Western and traditional African techniques to create a unique approach that was wholly South African. Rhoda Orlin was principally a teacher, reaching beyond her accepted base to reach talent of any background, and she also choreographed. Sylvia Glasser established her own company out of her garage in a middle-class Johannesburg suburb called Moving Into Dance Maupatong in defiance of apartheid regulations. Adele Blank formed the Free Flight Dance Company together with Christopher Kindo, similarly ignoring the apartheid strictures. Rhoda's daughter, Robin Orlin, became the enfant terrible of contemporary dance, challenging the perceptions of her audiences and authority with a series of created works that are simultaneously philosophical critiques of her society and explorations of the nature of performance. Though she's regarded as a South African national treasure, she is particularly adored in Europe, winning a string of honors and has made a home in Berlin. To bring our survey of South African Jewish involvement in the arts to a close, a brief glance at literature reveals three names that must be mentioned, though many others have left their literary mark. Born and raised in copies in the Orange Free State, the child of a Litvak father and an English mother, Olga Kirsch was an unusual exception to the Jewish writers of South Africa in that she wrote mostly in Afrikaans. Her chosen form was poetry, and she became the second female Afrikaans poet to be published in South Africa. The advent of the Afrikaner nationalist government and her revulsion for apartheid policies and the declaration of the State of Israel led her to making Aliyah in 1948, settling in Rehovot, and Israel became her permanent home. She married a mathematics professor at the Weizmann Institute and studied English literature at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And then Kirsch did something truly remarkable. In addition to Afrikaans writing, Olga began to compose her poetry in English and in Hebrew. Kirsch wrestled with her identity as a South African, as a Jew, as an Israeli, and the Afrikaans literati have been wrestling over claiming her as one of their own ever since. Sarah Gertrude Millen has left a troubled legacy that still bedevils her place in South African literature. Principally a novelist, her output was initially acclaimed, but a thematic obsession with race and acceptance of early 20th century attitudes towards racial identity in the country has led to a consignment as an historical curiosity and rejection as a significant shaper of local literature. Out of favor and out of print, she's become a footnote at odds with her initial popularity. That brings us to Nobel laureate Nadine Gordimer. Born in Springs to a Lithuanian immigrant father who was a watchmaker, 
and a mother who came from an assimilated London family, Gordimer was raised in a secular household. She began writing at an early age, publishing her first short stories in the New Yorker magazine. Though she associated with intellectuals who were anti-apartheid activists, it was the Sharpeville massacre that spurred Nadine's own activism. Something that was fused into her literary creativity as well as her personal life. She had joined the ANC when it was an underground organization and helped Nelson Mandela craft his famous speech from the dock when he was on trial. Her activism wasn't confined to anti-apartheid work. She was a tireless campaigner in anti-censorship and freedom of speech awareness internationally, as well as working for HIV AIDS activism in South Africa. In addition, she was highly critical of Israeli policies towards the Palestinians, but despite her disavowal, a thesis remains to be written on the Jewish principles to be discerned in her writings. We might say that South African Jewry, having established themselves in an alien land, built alongside and together with the other inhabitants a structure and society, then through its creative artists, breathed a complex soul, Neshoma, into its identity. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this. Hi, <laughs> um, Gail. Um, you you muted, Mark. That was yeah. fantastic. You know, the the silence at the end was not just because we couldn't sort ourselves out. It was in astonishment for <laughs> the wonderful things that we've uh, we've thank seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Gail, and then Veronica. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank Mark so, you know, sincerely for that wonderful, honestly, um, treat. And also Alan, who couldn't be with us today. And I think that that was really great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think it's really the tip of the iceberg of all the, the wonderful talent that came out of South Africa. There's so many more people in each of the fields that you mentioned. And, um, you know, we could go, I think we could have about five different uh, Zoom sessions just on them, because in every single one, I could think of others and more questions and more ways of looking at things. And it was very interesting the way that you chose those particular people. But uh, I mean, they were just everybody. They were so talented. And that came out and, um, you know, in such a short while. What I did want to say well, I didn't stop you, but um, in, from my personal research or reading, I, I came across the name of Gluckman from a medical point of view. And, um, you know, Leon Gluckman was his son. Henry Gluckman was a physician who was born at the end of the last the previous century. And he was a politician, a Jewish politician. And he was in um, the government in 1945. And they gave him... Because he was a politician and the health minister, they actually gave him the um, job or the task of being chairman to the National Health Service Commission. He was supposed to decide or try and work out what kind of medicine would be practiced in South Africa. And it's really interesting because he was a very, very, very um, revolutionary thinker. And he th said that everybody should be getting um, equal treatment. The blacks should be getting medical treatment just as the whites should be getting and that there should be a tax on this so that everybody could be treated equally. And what happened was it worked for three years. Three years they were just getting to that uh, where they were going to have, like in Israel and in England, a National Health Service with, you know, little health clinics all over the show. 
when the national government came into power in 1948. And then they decided that uh, the blacks didn't, you know, deserve to get equal or, or health treatment just automatically. And so that fell through. And it was fascinating to me to see how his son went into this field of film and acting and, you know, uh, and, and that was his dad. Anyway, that was my little contribution. Thank well, you. Thank you. Veronica, you wanted to say something? Yes, yes. No, I just echo everything Gail said. I thought it was excellent. I thought you really, they, you really as Gail said, they, obviously there are other people, but I think you really, um, uh, Alan certainly, I think he got them really the most important people. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I was glad, you know, that Yiddish theatre is my particular interest. I've done a little book on it. I don't know if Alan <laughs> consulted that amongst other things, because I recognize pictures probably from the South African, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies in Johannesburg. Mm. That's where yes. one finds most. <laughs> I yes. found my pictures, yeah. So I was uh, glad uh, in that, that she was featured, like that he found some lovely photos. Because I just wanted to mention uh, a new book has come out. You interviewed Hazel Frankel, who had just yes. published a book on um, David Fram, and it was published in the UK by a, a crowd that calls itself Legenda. Uh, I think it's an offshoot of Oxford Press. Um, and I have there very recently a book was published called Women on the on the Yiddish Stage, obviously looking at women internationally. And I have a chapter there on Sarah Sylvia. Oh, and really? um yeah, yeah, yeah. I must, you know, the books have become, I mean, I know Hazel Frankel's got the same problem. The books are so because of because the rand is so weak, books are just so expensive. Um yeah, when you you know convert from pounds or from dollars, it's it's uh, a problem. But um, I must get uh, <clears throat> this woman on the Yiddish stage into um, into our libraries. I um, the, in fact there was something that was mentioned there that Alan mentioned how she went to London in the first place. I'll have to listen to that again because there was something that I missed. Yeah. And also, by the way, I really enjoy Alan Swerdlow. I used to enjoy him on the radio, <laughs> and I just don't. I just thought he just does it so um, relaxed and so well. Yeah, he's completely natural. Um, you know, Alan said in the opening sequence that of of this episode, and it really um, carries through to all the episodes that we had to we had to pick and choose a few people. To, to represent the whole, as Alan, as Alan says. And, you know, the, our challenge really never was to find to find people. It was actually who we were going to have to leave out. And I think that was rather sad about it. And, you know, even though this, this whole series lasts for eight hours, I think if we'd gone into more detail, it, the series would be more than double that, you know, maybe double that in, 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 in time frame, just to give everyone an opportunity, you know, the hoteliers, for example, I mean the people who owned little hotels in Freyhaite, and they they may have made such contributions to that community, and we we just couldn't discuss everyone. So, you know, we just blanketly referred to to Sol Kersner and, and made him represent, you know, so many other people in the industry. And you know, sadly, we had to leave so many people out, and I've, it's it's a great pity. Um, and then getting back to your your what you said about sourcing of images, David Sachs at the Jewish Board was incredibly helpful. Yes. He gave us his whole archive of material and said, "Please use it." Um, you know, we found, and I think that's because so much of the quality of the imagery is bad. Is that it's a replication of something that's been, you know, from an old newspaper that's been photocopied and digitized and recopied and redigitized and you know sadly we just couldn't afford to buy original material and I, I think I mentioned uh, previously that um, there is a huge archive with Getty images now Getty was owned and started by a Johannesburg guy um, who was a King David Linksfield and I was introduced to him and made contact with him and they wanted $499 per image now, you know, if you convert that to rands 
and then multiplied by the thousands of images that we've used throughout the series, you know, we would have had a had to have our personal banker to bankroll the production and never mind production costs, just an image cost. So sadly, many of our images are images we big borrowed and stolen from various sources. I think you've been amazing in the images that you've got. I mean, nobody felt there was anything missing because whenever you spoke about something, there was an image and a relevant and a time-related image. It was amazing. Myra Goldenbaum, you wanted to say something. Um, firstly, I'm very impressed with this. Um, having been in theatre since I arrived here from Zimbabwe, um, Mark, I think it's very important that not only for the Jewish community, I think we have to show the people today what the Jewish community did in theatre and everything. I think it is so vitally important. And we've got to reach out far, far beyond just this kind of, um, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But I think we have to reach out and show the rest of South Africa what the Jews did for this country. Well, well maybe um, maybe Mara, as you know, with the Union of Jewish Women, you can find a way to make these films more readily available or show them to people, you know, sort of maybe there's something you can do to help. Um, I think it's it's gonna have to be something broader. Um, but I feel that we're just not reaching out enough to show what we do. Can I suggest I think, about what is the population at the moment? I think 35,000. Uh, and very... I think when you think of all the, the big companies we've done, especially now, we have to reach out. Thanks. It's very important, but there are also it's... ramifications to that. If I can interrupt for a second. Do you mind? Carry on, Philip. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I mean, what you've assembled is utterly extraordinary. And of course, there are going to be people that are left out. So I think that's inevitable. For instance, one person went during dance, uh, Mavis Becker, for instance, came to mind, who got a damehood given to her by the Spanish uh, government for a contribution to Spanish dance. And there have been other people, you know, in theatre, which I'm not as familiar with. The only thing in the art arena, um, I think Robin Sasson might not have been as fully aware of the contribution of Jewish artists, even currently. I'm not going to sort of reel off names, but there's certainly been some amazing contributions. Uh, I don't know if current includes Ken, who wasn't mentioned at all, uh, and is still very busy producing amazing things, that, which are very current in terms of not only um, regular art, but performing art as well. So I think, and in film in particular, things that are happening, which I find amazing. So I think, uh, that is, but one of the problems about uh, Jewish contributions is they punch over their weight. Definitely. And I think it does cause quite an uh, element. I think, I think one's got to recognize it. Of You are highly present and one pays for that degree of presence and people feeling almost threatened by being overtaken by or being edged up by etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a sensitivity there that i think one needs also to be conscious of you know when you when you think that the majority of, of south african jews arrived here as penniless refugees you know they didn't arrive here with lots of money and start buying up camps bay you know it just wasn't like that they you know even the 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 greatest mining magnets and landlords who we have here you know they arrived with nothing you know they some of them walked from Durban to, to the minefields in Kimberley. They really didn't have anything. So the achievements have been really overwhelming. And in one of the previous episodes, uh, we mentioned about the people in the medical and science industry, and they've won 40% of South Africa's Nobel Prizes. So I mean, four out of 10 of the Nobel Prizes in South Africa have been won by, by Jews. The others have been peace prizes and military prizes and things like that. But, you know, to think of in such a short space of time, I mean, the, the first Nobel Prize winner in Africa was a South African Jew. So this punching above our weight is, I think it's quite a common, a common thought. And 
you know, as was as was mentioned by Myra a little earlier, that you know the story needs to be told, but at the same time, people don't want to tell the story. You know, there's this whole thing of let's not keep our head above the parapet and let's keep very quiet and and try and slink away. And I think um, to me that's a defensive position. And I think it's it's historically it's been a very sad indictment of Jews have been allowed to be victimized because you know we've always been on the defensive and you know it's it's a great pity and you know whether it's a pogrom and inquisition and expulsion you know the Holocaust it's we it's always, we've always been on the back foot um, and so to stand up proudly and say we're Jewish and wave the flag you know suddenly people get insulted and say you know. How dare you call out your your status? And I think we can see what's happened since October the seventh, where you know even in, in in South Africa, it's an appalling the situation that's happening here. But you know what can be done? You know, and I see Howard Feldman and uh, not Howard Feldman, Howard Sexton had something published recently, but saying you know do we pack our bags? You know, but then where do you go? You know, the UK and the USA and Europe and you know, unless you can find some very quiet little Greek island you, you no one's going to invade, or maybe Antarctica, you know, we have, we, we're here and we have to make the best of us. Okay, I just add, it's got nothing to do with anything, but the hmm. final scene happened uh, where um, Alan was surrounded by books, happens to be the Jacob Gittin Library. Yes, yes. Which is the only Jewish library in uh, Africa. But are there's one in Durban. No, it's not an open Jewish library, which is open to the public for lending and for research purposes. I uh, see, yes, the Durban it's one is closed. Yeah, it's not a repository, it's simply a repository of books, is genuinely yes. alive. Yeah, quite right. I mean, you know, what's going on in Cape Town really is, is you know, we've got the Kaplan Institute and you've got the Jewish Museum and we've got all the events they hold, you've got the Gitlin Library. I think in terms of the Jewish community in Cape Town, they're far more dynamic and far more active um, as a community. But then it goes back historically, the Cape uh, Jewish community and the and the Transvaal Jewish community have really been, been the best of friends. Um, and that's also historical, you know. Well, that's why there's semigration to Cape Town, which is quite interesting. And yes. a very warm welcome is given to those people who are coming down. There's certainly a, a sense of outreach, which is important. Yeah, you know, and it even goes further when we were trying to, trying to introduce, uh, uh, interview the Jewish Board of Deputies up here in Johannesburg, they all refused to be interviewed. Um, whereas when we went down, um, you know, Gwen Robbins was only too happy to chat to us. You know, she was quite open and welcoming and Sat us down and gave us a repository of a lot of information. Yes, and she was amazing. I believe she's retired now, but um, she was an amazing lady to speak to. Retiring is what you do when you go to bed at night. When it's still very active. Oh, okay, all right. You know, I mean, I, I hate this ageist thing where you turn sixty-five and suddenly you put out to pasture, uh, because most of us have still got many years to many productive years ahead. Sure. So you redesign your life. That's the other thing that you can be creative about. Yes, well, I haven't reinvented myself as a filmmaker, so um, I spend my life... And we appreciate that. You see, you can still contribute. Yes, yes. I mean, I, when I started, I was a retiree, so I mean, there's always a second chance in life, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so please, as, as you as had Percy as, as Jews, we do not retire. No. <laughs> we I'm do not retire. We work. Some people. I know we one find or two. something else, and we do something else, and we create all the time. Yes. Playing golf or bridge all day is not fine. No, no, no. That's not my scene. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> there have been some wonderful messages in the in the chat. Um, Marks, thanks so much for wonderful things as ever. Mass. Um, Moss, Lynette Douglas says, what a rich experience we had as young people. We knew most of those people. So for uh, some of us, it was really <laughs> the story of our, the, the, the soundtrack of our life. 
Mm -hmm. And Pamela Bonner in Israel says, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, so there's some wonderful um, thing. And somebody was even related to Sylvia, Sarah Sylvia, was my maternal okay. grandfather's first cousin on his mother's side. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bokova. Yes. Uh, Lynette um, Douglas was very, very strong and very active in the Union of Jewish Women. I did mean to say when um, when we were shooting in the um, Johannesburg Philharmonic, um, we planned to do the shoot, and of course we went there, and they were playing that piece of music. Now we'd never planned it with them; it just happened to be that that piece of music that they were playing that day, which essentially is the melody for her tikva. So it, it was actually quite an interesting experience that um, we were there talking about the history of South African Jewry. And this piece of music was being rehearsed by the orchestra. Um, and I wasn't aware of it. And, and you know, Alan and all his great knowledge, um, you know, gave me the whole story about it. So um, we, we were glad it was part of the program, even though it was uh, quite incidental. Yes, it was amazing. There's Smetan is my lust, you know, where they do the... the... The Moldau, which is the two, the same Czech tune that uh, Tikva comes from, so that mm. was extraordinary that that happened to be on the day. Um, Zola, I just wanted to, just a little anecdote for some of the people who may not have known, but it was Sarah Sylvia through the African Consolidated Theatres. She was the one who found my mother after the in in one of the deportation camp. Uh, displaced persons camps she was entertaining in Europe after the war and she asked my mother to come to South Africa to perform in the Yiddish theater Heide mm -hmm. Rosenthal was my mother so it is because of Sarah Sylvia that we made our home here and my mother was on her way to America because Molly Pickon had arranged papers to get to the USA but my Sarah got to her first and brought her to Cape Town and my mother said, who needs America? Cape Town is paradise. And that was that. A smart lady. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Thank you for telling us. Okay, well, does anybody else want to say anything, make any comments? I think that we can see what Daniel Danielle Lockwood wrote. So many South African Jews came to the UK and were awarded honours by the British government for the arts. Anthony, who is this? I can't see. Sure, something. sure. Anthony Sure, right. Ronald Harwood, Herbert Bretzma, Janet Sussman, and our own Geraldine. <laughs> a lot to be proud of. And I think on that note, we can sort of have a cup of tea, right, Geraldine? You promised me a cup of tea in Israel. Yeah, I'll put the kettle on and we we'll just you. wish for okay. calm and happiness in Israel and that okay. things don't escalate and that they they settle down and there can well, be I'm some sure, sure. outcome. So we And please bring the hostages home. Mm. Okay. Geraldine. From yeah. your mouth. I'd like to say that it's been a delight to be associated with the Kimberley group. Um my mother was a Blumenthal Central Jewelers and I'm Trevor Tobe's cousin, but this has been an enormous enrichment. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for coming. Thank, thank you all for coming. And, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I really enjoyed it. And um, it was quite by accident that I was introduced to you. It was through Adam Mendelssohn, and I must thank him. Um, and I'm now going to be a keen supporter of, of all the um, programs that you produce. Thank you very much, and thank you again, Mark. For September, we're going to look at uh, research into South African Jewish history, and that is going to be run by um, Adam Mendelssohn together with Shirley Gilbert, who's a professor of Jewish history at University College London. So between them, they've uh, created, uh, they are editors of the Jewish Historical Journal, and the current issue is about South African research, 
It's also listed on the Hull website under journals. So if you want to look it up, but they'll be talking about research, researching and researchers on South African Jewish history. And we'll do that in September. But do keep in touch. Tell us what you're interested in, what, you, what you'd like to do, what you'd like to contribute, what your stories are. And, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, call is something that grows organically according to what you deliver. You know, we're just a platform. We're just a, a receptacle. We're a vessel for your input. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Mark, for making this wonderful series and for presenting it to us. And uh, we'll see you again, hopefully, soon. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you.